We have reached the acme of the presentation this afternoon, and it is my pleasure to introduce our didactic speaker of the evening, Dr. Matilda, Matilda Ongondi. Dr. Ongondi is a consultant physician and clinical hematologist, hemato-oncologist at the Kenyatta National Teaching and Referral Hospital. She holds a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery degree and a Master of Medicine degree in internal medicine, both from the University of Nairobi. She is registered with the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentists Council as an internal medicine specialist. She is passionate about clinical bedside teaching and mentorship. Dr. Matilda is a member of various societies, the Kenya Society of Hematologists and Oncologists, European Hematology Association, and International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. Her presentation will take 30 minutes. So, Ladies and gentlemen, help me in welcoming Dr. Matilda this evening. Welcome, Dr. Matilda. Thank you very much. And I am glad to uh, uh, join you this evening and also very thankful to the presenters for giving me this opportunity. I just want to confirm that you can hear me well. Very well. Okay, wonderful. So we shall start. So today I have a huge task of uh, trying to cover a very big topic in just 30 minutes and trying to give you a broad overview. And hopefully what I uh, intend to do is uh, sensitize us. Maybe for some people it will be reminders uh, on things that um, uh, we look at when we talk about from embolism, which you know is a big, big topic. I was looking at the chat to see where people are from. I see not everyone has indicated or what they do, uh, but a few people I've seen um, responded uh, being from various facilities. So feel free to, if you have any questions as we go along to note them, uh, there'll be a question and answer session at the end. So we can proceed to the next slide, please. So to help us for our discussion today, we're going to look at various things. I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time on some, and for others, I will just gloss through. Um, seeing someone is saying network is bad, not hearing. Is this applicable to everyone, or are the other people able to hear me well? I, I don't know if it's just the one participant. I hear you very well. You're very okay, clear. wonderful. So I'll spend a bit more time on some areas and then gloss through others uh, because I have been informed that you'll be given the slides and I've included some references as well to help us uh, um, when we are going through the slides. Next slide, please. So when we talk about thromboembolism, or if we just touch on the subject thrombosis first, uh, we can't talk about thrombosis without talking about this gentleman, uh, Vacho, who was a German physician. He wore many hats, but is known as the father of pathology. And he came up with this uh, description of uh, risk factors in terms of big categories that would put a patient at, uh, would make them more prone to developing a blood clot. So either stasis or vessel wall injury or hypercoagulability. And I just put this quote down there that shows, uh, you know, he even, when we talk about embolism, was talking about the detachment of larger or smaller fragments from the end of the softening thrombus, which are carried out along by the current of blood and driven into remote vessels. This gives rise to the very frequent process to which I have bestowed the name embolia. You can see even the English that he was using. So the reason we worry about uh, thrombosis is why? Um, one, because uh, of the risk of pulmonary embolism, or for some patients, as we shall look at in the clinical presentation, that uh, they 
present primarily with uh, pulmonary thromboembolism. So those are the most common uh, things that we shall see. So when we look at the individual factors, uh, those actors, and I'm hoping uh, uh, if we can proceed to the next slide, if we bear in mind this virtuous triad, as we will bear in mind the virtuous triad um, and look at the various factors, uh, various studies have been found, have been done, and they have found that some factors are more prone or have a higher risk of uh, leading a patient to getting thrombosis than others. Now, all of them are important. And when we're evaluating a patient, we'll be trying to address and find out, does the patient have any of these risk factors? So I'll encourage us that this is one of the tables that would really need to go through there. And the article is found in the circulation journal. But if you if I was to just pick a few examples at random and then bring it home to what we commonly refer to as a virtuous triad. So if a patient has a fracture of the lower limb, we know that this patient will be immobile uh, depending on where the fracture is. Uh, so there'll be some element of stasis. Then also dependent on the site of the fracture, uh, you may have some element of vessel wall injury. If a patient has a hip or knee replacement, again, you have the aspect that, yes, the patient may be immobile for a few days, but then you're really talking about vessel wall injury because of the surgical procedure. If I look at, uh, let's go to the middle column, if I pick something like uh, cancer, so a patient who has cancer, uh, cancer has, uh, is one of the important risk factors that we look at, and we know that that predisposes the patient to having a hypercoagulable state. If someone, a patient gets a stroke, they are immobile, so that contributes to the stasis. So having that big approach helps us, and then each time you're looking at a patient, you're trying to find out what is the risk factor? Is there something that's causing stasis? Sometimes that stasis may be because of a local obstruction. Maybe a patient has a pelvic mass. Um, is it because of vessel wall injury? Has the patient had trauma? Have they had surgery? Uh, um, is it because of hypercoagulability? And in our context, also important to remember infections, especially something like HIV. So let's move on to the next. So when we look at the epidemiology, uh, we know that from the is the third most common cause of morbidity and mortality after myocardial infarction and stroke. And this is when you simply look at cardiovascular diseases. I looked at some of the literature that's uh, from my country that is Kenya, just giving us a small glimpse in terms of uh, what did the local data find. So uh, there's a retrospective study that was done, small numbers, 128. And you can see the patient population was a young patient population. The mean age was 40.8. And look at some of the comorbidities that this patient had, hypertension, TB, HIV, uh, some of them it was in the context of puparium, so that's after delivery, some were found to be uh, diabetic, and others uh, um, uh, had a smoking history. But look at that mortality, very high, 28.1%. So that means this is a topic we cannot uh, ignore. And then uh, we have another study that was puparium setting, and they found a five-year incidence of 1.8 per thousand deliveries, most of these cases being deep vein thrombosis. And most of the times when 
when people say deep vein thrombosis, they mean uh, thrombosis in the lower extremities. And 5.1% only had pulmonary embolism. Another study was done in the context of cancer patients, looking at the incidence of thrombosis in cancer patients, and they found an incidence of 10.9%, being more in females, those who had comorbidities, and those who had a poor performance status. Next slide, please. So when we go on to clinical presentation, and this is also a very important part because most of the time, what you will be doing as a clinician or the first person who's seeing this patient, the patient may come with an obvious symptom, we'll go through them, or they may have vague symptoms. And what we need to have is a high index of suspicion. So if we move on to the next slide, and um, just starting from the very uh, um, extreme uh, left, which may be your right, is that we've said most of the presentations will be involving the lower limbs. So a patient may come with swelling, they may have pain. The swelling will be dependent on the level of involvement of the blood. Uh, of the blood clot, such that maybe a patient who just has the distal blood vessels involved may just complain of calf pain and swelling, whereas a patient who has the proximal vessels involved may complain of their whole lower limb swelling or uh, and having severe pain. Sometimes they may be change of color. Remember, there are other things that can cause leg swelling. So whenever I teach students, we talk about unilateral lower limb swelling and bilateral. So when you're thinking of DVT, this is a patient who has unilateral lower limb swelling, or if they have bilateral, one side seems more than the other or they have pain. So this is very important. I've used the term proximal and distal, and most of the time, this is in reference to the blood vessel that's involved, such that for patients who have involvement of the vessels distal to the popliteal vein, you call that distal, and when you have involvement of the more proximal vessels, so from the popliteal, femoral, iliacs, you call that a proximal DVT, and those ones are more prone to uh, the term that we talked about at the beginning, the embolia. Term, so pulmonary thromboembolism. Now, in the study, also in, in uh, practice, you'll find this. Also, when you read the literature, you'll find that it's when you have involvement of the lower limbs, the left seems to be more prone than the right. And there's, there's an anatomical reason for, for this. And this is because the right common iliac, as, uh, as is illustrated in the picture in the middle, crosses over the left common iliac vein. So already anatomically, you have more prone, uh, a more prone area so that when you add your additional factors, then you find most patients will have DVT involving the left lower limb. Now a patient, remember each time we are treating or we find a patient with DVT, there's that risk of embolism. So the right, the image on the right is a, a CT pulmonary angiogram, and you can see where the arrow is pointing. There's that uh, grayish uh, line across, and that is a thrombus, what is called a saddle thrombus. So patients who have pulmonary thromboembolism, how would they present? Uh, they may have shortness of breath, sometimes all they may have is just a fast heart rate palpitations. Um, sometimes they may have chest pain, depending on the extent of the clot. Uh, when you get the slides, look at that first statement that Vacho, say, uh, Vacho said. He said sometimes the fragments may be large, sometimes they may be small. It may be in the large vessels, in the small vessels. So also when patients have pulmonary thromboembolism, their symptoms would be dependent on the size of the clot and the vessel involved. Because we know that when patients have a massive 
pulmonary thromboembolism, they can have hemodynamic instability. That means their blood pressures will be low. And sometimes you've heard of even patients who've died and uh, when a post-mortem is performed, they are found to have uh, pulmonary embolism. So this is not something that's to be taken lightly. So to recap, you uh, have the symptoms involving the lower extremities, the swelling, pain, maybe discoloration. And for uh, the pulmonary thromboembolism, chest pain, shortness of breath, and palpitation. Sometimes they may have cough hemoptysis. Next slide, please. So those are the most common presentations, but sometimes you can have unusual sites. So most of the times when you, you know, listen to a talk on embolism, on thrombosis, you'll just uh, either get focused on the lower extremities or pulmonary embolism, but we have to remember you have you can have other sites being involved. And what are those other sites on the extreme? In the portal, uh, the splanchnic vessel. So you have the portal vein there, the superior mesenteric vein, inferior mesenteric vein, splenic vein. And if a patient has obstruction or occlusion of this from a thrombi, they may manifest as abdominal pain. Sometimes if this has happened over time, then you're having a backflow and what uh, we call collaterals. And this can also be reported, you know, in a good CT scan image that's done, or even just an ultrasound. Uh, sometimes if you're suspecting this in a patient, when you ask for an ultrasound, Ultrasound, then you need to tell, uh, indicate in your notes and say, please look or comment on the portal vessels. In the middle, there is a diagram showing the cerebral veins. So you can have involvement of the cerebral veins as well. So cerebral venous thrombosis, how would these patients present with headache? Uh, that's actually the most common presentation, headache. Uh, sometimes in extremis, they may have, they may even present with a stroke because the occlusion may be in the major vessels, like sometimes if the sagittal sinus is affected all the way, they can even have hemorrhage or an infarct. Um, so, or uh, have altered level of consciousness. So all of it is dependent on what is the size of the clot, what is the rapidity with which it has developed. And the other thing is when you have these tests, most of the times you want to look for things that cause hypercoagulability. We've talked of infection, but um, later we'll talk about uh, uh, entities called thrombophilias, which are inherited conditions that can also predispose patients uh, to getting thrombosis. Um, and sometimes it could be because of uh, blood conditions or blood malignancies, or like in the case I recall during training, um, um, uh, one time we saw a child who had extensive cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. The child was in DKA and the risk for this child was because of severe dehydration. Uh, other contexts is maybe because of meningitis. So sometimes it may be local causes for the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. And um, on the right, there is a diagram showing the veins in the upper extremities. So we say the lower extremities is most, more common, but this can also occur in the upper extremities. So here we are talking about a patient presenting with swelling of the hand, again, dependent on the vessel. If it's the neck vessels which are involved, they may have swelling of the neck. And in these instances, most times you find it's because of um, either the patient has had a line, a central line, uh, maybe if it's a patient who's in critical care, or sometimes we use uh, lines called peak lines, which are almost similar to your central lines for chemotherapy, for patients who are, who are having uh, procedures like pacemakers in situ, or sometimes it may be because of malignancies. There are times you find a patient having a mediastinal mass, and then that's causing compression of the vessels that drain the neck and the upper extremities. So these patients present with swelling of the neck or swelling of the face. 
So that's something to think about. So I think if we miss anything else from today's lecture is to remember the risk factors and the clinical presentation, because the most important thing is to have that high index of suspicion, because if you don't suspect it, then that means you won't be able to go into the next step, which is what we are going to discuss now, that is about in, um, investigation. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, so when when we look at investigations i usually like talking about investigations in in categories there are those investigations that you will do to confirm your diagnosis then there are those investigations that you will do because they they have an impact of the choice of treatment and there are those investigations that you will do to look for the risk factors we've talked about some of the risk factors so in terms of confirming diagnosis we've said again and again high index of suspicion um so i'll i'll start i know the slides of uh, the first thing is the d dimer but we uh for this i'll want uh i'll discuss it a bit here and then put it in context when we look at some scores so what's the d dimer this is a blood test that measures the fibrin degradation product so when the blood it, when a uh, um, Uh, Dr. Matilda, you muted. Sorry, I was muted by the host. <laughs> okay, all right. So when the when the when the blood uh, when the body dissolves the blood clot, the end product of fibrinolysis is a fibrin degradation product, and this is what the D dimer is. And this is important because if it's elevated, then it can it it infers that in the body there's some breakdown of clot that is going on. Um, now there are other things that can cause the D dimer to be elevated. So it's important that you know it can be elevated in the context of malignancies in a patient who's hospitalized in cases of of severe infection. We've seen that with COVID-19, it's one of the markers that is checked for and um, in inflammatory disease as well as pregnancy. So when do we use the D-dimer then? It's very important for its negative predictive value. What does that mean? That if you do a D-dimer and it's negative, for sure that patient is highly unlikely to have a blood clot. The other important thing I'll just mention about the D dimers increasingly, what's been advocated now is an age adjusted D dimer because beyond the age of 50, the D dimer increases. So, uh, what is encouraged now with most labs is to give references based on the age. Now, for confirming that clot, you, you know, you'll need imaging. So, for the lower extremities, your Doppler ultrasound very important, um, and you want the ultrasonographer to tell you the extent of the clot. Uh, so, a good ultrasound should tell you know comment on the veins all the way from the distal to your proximal vessels, the iliac, so that they tell you where the clot is, but then also comment on how the other vessels are. And then for a pulmonary embolism, the best would be to do a CT pulmonary angio. There are some instances where you may not be able to do this, uh, although increasingly now there's a protocol that has been approved for even for pregnancy that has a low exposure to contrast. But but ideally, uh, you'd want to really avoid doing that. But a VQ scan is what would be used, a ventilation perfusion scan, but we know this may not be available at many, many centers. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, so we talked about uh, tests to confirm. So your Doppler ultrasound of the extremities, lower extremities or upper extremities, if it's the 
abdomen, your doc and uh, ultrasound can help, but the best would be to do a CT as well as the neck vessels as well, especially once it's the deep veins, uh, sometimes beyond, you know, the, the, the internal jugular, you may not be able to see so much more with the ultrasound. So most of the times the radiologist will recommend you do CT imaging, like if you think the patient has a superior vena cover um, uh, thrombosis. So there are tests that you will do to try and determine the underlying cause. There are tests that you do to try and determine severity. Is this a patient who, uh, like if it's in the context of pulmonary embolism, I'm going to manage at home or in the hospital. What are the treatments I'm going to give? So you want a blood count, UACs, LFTs, uh, um, coagulation profile. That's a simple INR and APTT. So if you're just to get a few tests, uh, at least a baseline uh, total blood count so that you know what your platelet is. Liver um, and an INR, if you don't may not have uh, the liver function test, but that would be important so that if they are deranged, you know, uh, you may want to alter how the dose that you're, the, you're giving. The INR and APTT are important because if a patient already has an underlying coagulopathy, that means the INR is abnormal and the APTT, depending on the level, you may not be able to fully anticoagulate that patient. So that's why you want to you want to check this test because remember we are to do no harm. So you, we do not want to cause bleeding and sometimes the bleeding can be catastrophic in these patients. Next slide, please. So um, just because we don't have a lot of time, but I'll use some cases that I've seen. Um, so this is just one case of a gentleman I saw a couple of weeks ago, um, 42 year old, uh, who presented with left lower limb swelling. So his entire left lower limb was swollen. And uh, I mentioned that in the, in the slide earlier, we talked about the D-dimer being used in those who have a low or intermediate score. So these are the scores. There's a Wells criteria for DVT. There's a Wells criteria for PE. And uh, so for this gentleman, 42, he's, uh, he has known comorbidities. He's not had any weight loss, no change in bile habits. He's not had any recent trauma, no recent surgery. Um, and he has no wounds on his uh, skin, no ulcers. Um, and he just comes with this left lower limb swelling. Now of note is that he works as a truck driver. So he's a long distance truck driver. So that is important in this page because if you recall our virtuous triad, he doesn't check off on any of the other things except immobilization that comes with long travels. Um, so if we look at this Wells criteria, there's nothing to point towards active malignancy from history. Uh, he, immobility for three days, surgery, no. Calf swelling, yes, one leg was swollen more than the other. Collaterals, no, the entire leg is swollen, yes. He didn't have tenderness when you examined him along the veins. He didn't have any edema. He, is, he walked to the clinic. Uh, now, another important history. So anytime you see a patient, you want to ask them, is this the first time you're getting this problem? So like for this patient, this is the second time he's had this problem. A couple of months back, he was treated for the same. So this is a recurrent uh, event because he also came in with a Doppler ultrasound that confirmed the extent that this was a proximal uh, DVT. Uh, involving his uh, femoral uh, vessels. So you can see already he's scoring three. So he's high risk. So in, if you're somewhere where you can't even do a D-dimer for this patient, you know, it doesn't, uh, actually there's even no indication because for him, his clinical and uh, physical findings point towards DVT. So what would you do if you don't have a Doppler with you at that time? If there is no contraindication, you would start treatment as you await your Doppler or as you refer the patient to the next facility where a Doppler ultrasound can be done. So if this moderate or low risk, they're the ones who you do your D-dimer so that 
Yes, if their score is one to two or even minus two, because an alternative diagnosis, remember we said anything else, it could be cellulitis. So that's why you're asking, is there any trauma? Is there any wound? Is there any ulcer? Uh, it could be lymphedema. So you, that's why you would get a minus two. So in those instances, then you do a D-dimer so that if it's positive, then that tells you there's a higher likelihood that this is DBT. So you'd want to start the patient on treatment or if you are able to get that immediately do the Doppler um, and then put the patient on treatment. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, the Wells criteria for PE. So this is another case, this is a 67 year old who I was asked to review. She'd been transferred from a town um, hours away for those who are in Kenya, a place called Isiolo. And uh, she, she, the lady is obese, but she has no comorbidities. So a month ago, she had fallen off from a motorbike and sustained a fracture of the left femur for which an open reduction and internal fixation was done and she was healing nicely, had been discharged, was ambulating with a walker, and then she developed shortness of breath. And uh, so, of course, with that history, the thing you're worried about is, could she have thrown a clot? Could she have pulmonary embolism? And when she uh, was transferred and landed uh, in uh, Nairobi, um, she, uh, her blood pressure was fine. She did not have tachycardia, but her oxygen level was low, all right? So if we had to look at this score, uh, did she have previous PE? No, was she tachycardic? Her heart rate was just 100. She'd had surgery, so that gives her a score of 1.5. She didn't have any hemoptysis. From history, there was no history of weight loss, early satiety, no postmenopausal bleeding. She had normal bowel habits, no bone pain. So, you know, you want to ask all those questions looking for malignancy. And on examination, she had swelling on the, on the left lower limb. This was the limb where she had also been operated on. Um, so could, could there be also DVT there? That's a possibility. So three, and then alternative diagnosis, less likely three. So for her, you can see she's scoring 4.5. So there's the original version and the simplified version. Whichever way you look at it, she is already scoring on the PE likely. Um, next slide, please. So there's also another score that's used for PE that looks pretty much are the same thing. But so this is how we would then use this cause in a clinical setting. And where it's unlikely, then you do your D-dimer. Next slide, please. So I'll sort of go through the next uh, part very quickly in the interest of time, because I have seen that already um, uh, our time is uh, far much spent. But I think if, you know, if all that you pick is having that high index of suspicion and being able to do that initial workup, then I think I would have done, you know, my work well, uh, because that's where the ball is dropped on many occasions, or that's where many patients are missed because we are not thinking about it. So in terms of treatment, there are many drugs that can be used and time won't allow me to discuss each of them in detail, but we have, um, I'll start with the far left heparin, we have the good old and fractionated heparin uh, that is used. However, we know for most, for a long time and, uh, and uh, preferentially, it's given as an IV infusion. And this becomes a challenge. But somewhere around, I think, 2004, the American chest um, um, uh, physician guidelines actually advocated for the heparin to be given as subcutaneously, which helps then in a setting where you're not able to really monitor your APTT. This is unfractionated heparin. But if you have given a patient that, the volumes are usually very big. But it's important to know that because um, in case you don't get low molecular weight heparin, you can still use your unfractionated heparin. The unfractionated heparin acts by increasing the effect of your natural anticoagulant, which is antithrombin, by blocking your factor 10, factor 9, um, 
factor 11 and factor 12, and then you have clexane. So clexane is much better because its pharmacokinetics is more predictable. Um, it's given subcutaneously, so you and it's uh, easy to use. Um, and it's given as a twice daily dosing. Uh, sometimes you can give it as a once daily. So it's one milligram per kg. And how does the clexane work for the low molecular weight heparin? It works by blocking factor 10A. So if I um, go to the next one is the warfarin of vitamin K antagonist. Good old warfarin, very good drug, very cheap, but has multiple drug interactions. So, and that's important to remember. If you're starting a patient on warfarin, you need to bridge. What does bridging mean? That means you can't start the patient on warfarin alone. You have to start them on an injectable uh, anticoagulant. So that would be heparin, either your low molecular weight or the unfractionated until they achieve a therapeutic high nerve. And we'll discuss about that in a few minutes. And why is this? Because initially, because warfarin will block your vitamin K dependent factors, that's your two, seven, uh, nine, and 10, but it will also block your natural anticoagulant protein CNS. So earlier on, it can actually increase the risk for your clot uh, progressing because of blocking the natural anticoagulants. Um, so it's very important to know if it's the first time your patient is on treatment, you're starting them on warfarin, you need to bridge that until they achieve a therapeutic INR. And what does that mean? You want an INR that's between two and three. Why two and three? We'll see that in the coming slides. Now, the other, uh, so a lot has happened, you know, in the past years, and we have other agents. So the warfarin is very good, but you have to keep monitoring the INR. And if you've managed or come across patients who are on warfarin, you know, they're doing the same thing. One day they come to the clinic, the INR is two. Then the next time they come to the clinic, nothing has changed. The INR is 1.6. Or the next time they come and the INR is 3.7 or 4. Uh, because of the many drug interactions. So we have other oral agents which have been, which are used and uh, these are more expensive. They are, they, uh, you have majority being factor 10A inhibitors as I've pointed there, Rivaroxaban, which goes by the brand name Zarelto. There's a generic in Kenya called Hatez, uh, Apixaban, which is even more costly than the rivaroxaban. Then you have endoxaban and the betrixaban. So what I find in practice is the rivaroxaban has gained a lot of momentum and it's being increasingly used. And especially now that there's also a generic that's available. Uh, Dabigatran is also another oral agent, but this one is a direct thrombin inhibitor. So the others are a factor 10A, and then the Dabigatran is a, a, a thrombin inhibitor. So these are all grouped as your direct oral anticoagulants, or what is referred to sometimes as a new oral anticoagulants, uh, although now they've been in the market for quite a bit of time. Next slide, please. So again, warfarin, and I'm mentioning this because it's what's commonly available. So, you know, the, the range is between two and three. Why? Because these studies were done and you can see the red line is showing thromboembolism. If your INR is less than two, you have a higher propensity of getting thromboembolism. That's on this graph that's on the left. Whereas if you look at the extreme right of the graph, that if a patient has uh, an INR of more than three, then their risk of thromboembolism is low, but then they have a higher risk of bleeding. So the effective is to keep it between two and three. Next slide, please. So again, um, principles that we would look at is, uh, is there any time you want to prescribe an anticoagulant? The next question should be, is there any reason uh, why this patient should not be on an anticoagulant or is there anything that would 
put them at a high risk of bleeding. So as I mentioned earlier, that's where your tests come in. What's the platelet count? What's the INR? How is your liver function test? What's the creatinine? Because like the new oral, uh, the direct oral anticoagulants, there's uh, most of them, except apixaban, you would not be able to use in a patient who has renal failure. Um, the, all the others you would avoid. Uh, so you'd either be using your warfarin or put the patient on apixaban. Uh, does the patient have hepatic disease from whatever reason, hepatitis, metastasis? Um, does the patient have low platelets? But also if we are using heparin, we have to still think about platelets because of a condition called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And I don't have enough time to go into this. Uh, but whenever we start patients on heparin, um, some, sometimes they can develop an autoimmune uh, phenomena where the, 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 uh, and you get antibodies that are um, against the heparin and they, those antibody drug complexes bind on the platelets and they are cleared uh, by your reticular endothelial system causing thrombocytopenia. So, uh, you want to, if a patient is on your, especially with the unfractionated heparin, you want to pay attention to that. What's the cost? You know, we've talked about these new drugs, good to give, not, you don't need to monitor, but what's the cost? Sometimes you may need to put the patient on the injectables, but each time, sometimes you have patients telling you, but this drug is too expensive. Ease of administrations. You, very few patients like to inject themselves. Yeah. And then what's the risk of bleeding in this patient? And that's an important thing to remember. Has this patient had a GI bleeding recently? Have they had, the other day, someone was consulting me about a patient who needed anticoagulation, but they had just taken the patient, uh, the patient had been conservatively managed for subdural hematoma, yeah? So when do you safely start anticoagulation in this patient? So we always have to think about, so at the beginning we talked about risk factors and then high index of suspicion. And now we are saying when you're looking at treatment, you always, you want to do no harm. So you want to find out, is it safe to put my patient on this treatment? Are there things that I need to monitor? And I think now for the remaining part of it, I will just uh, mention the slides because I'm seeing it's going to quarter to six. If we move on to the next slide and maybe uh, someone can just let me know on the chat uh, um, how much extra, how many few minutes I can have um, just to wind up. So when you see this patient the first time, you always want to ask, is this a patient I can manage at home or in hospital? And this would be dependent on a couple of things. So if it's DVT, it depends on uh, what medication are you starting, or even if it's PE. Because remember, we said if, uh, if uh, the patient has uh, uh, is able to doesn't have any complication or contraindication. You want to start them on the newer agents. Uh, on the limb, it's not a critical limb, meaning they don't have severe occlusion that's putting the perfusion of that limb at risk. Or you're not starting the patient on warfarin, meaning that you, you know, you're not, um, um, you don't need to bridge. You can start this patient on tablets, then they come to the clinic. And most of the times it will be a higher dose. So like, for example, Rivaroxaban, when you start them on uh, the treatment, you'd give them a higher dose, that's 15 milligrams twice a day for 21 days. Then after that, they would go on 20 milligrams once a day. If it's a patient who has PE, depending on where you are, uh, if, if we can move to the next, uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, uh, next slide. So, that slide, uh, the previous one was just showing a score that can help you to determine if a patient has PE, do they need to be monitored at home or uh, uh, started treatment at home or in the hospital. Uh, to be honest, in practice, depending on where you are, because if I look, I wanted this table because 
if we go back to that case, the patient I presented who had a, a fracture, had surgery, and then she presented with shortness of breath. When this lady had an echo, we found that she had signs of right ventricular strain, meaning the clot was big enough that it was causing strain on the right side of her heart. Now, sometimes you may not be able to do that echo immediately. Um, uh, so if you look at these parameters, so she was hypoxic, she needed oxygen, so she needs to be in hospital either way. And then she had signs of right ventricular dysfunction. But sometimes you may be somewhere where, fine, you can check with their oxygen levels, you put them on oxygen, but you're not able to do those other additional things. So it's actually not unwise to say and monitor this patient for 24, 48 hours, and then if they are stable, discharge them then on the tablets if it's a patient who's going to be on tablets. Next slide, please. So um, duration of treatment, most of the times that uh, you'll be put the patient, if it's the first time, uh, whether it's provoked or unprovoked, you're going to put them on at least three to six months of treatment. There are new guidelines which indicate that in the context where it is unprovoked, because most likely that means there's something else underlying that they need extended treatment. That's before beyond six months. But no one will give you a clear Dr. cut Mapu, on yeah. for how long. Yes, please. Uh, yes, you please. have just one minute, please. Not a problem. I'll actually stop here. Um, so uh, uh, most of the times, if we what we look at is how um, what are the risk factors that this patient has? Does the patient have a malignancy? If we can just uh, finish with the next one. Sorry, I said I'll finish with this one. This is a table that helps to see what is the risk of recurrence in the patient. So for instance, if we go to the far end, a patient who has active cancer, they need treatment for a long time until the cancer is cured or, you know, and six and uh, three to six months post the chemotherapy. A patient who's had recurrent DVT needs uh, a, what we call extended treatment or long life treatment. A patient who has antiphospholipid syndrome. So it depends on what we had mentioned earlier. What was the risk factor? Is this the first time they are getting a clot? Is this a recurrent clot? So that's what would inform how long you treat this patient for. But remember, if it's a first episode, you're going to treat them for three to six months. And the new guideline saying if it's unprovoked, meaning that you've not found any risk factor, then you'd want to treat them for a longer time. So I think in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there. And um, what I will just emphasize on, uh, you'll just look at these other slides, uh, which look at the uh, VTE in cancer. The slide that talks about what to do in the context of surgery, what to do in the context of pregnancy. We are not going to use those new agents. What about if the patient bleeds? Because sometimes a patient can bleed um, and they are on these agents. What should you do other than stopping the medication? Remember things like vitamin K for warfarin, your fresh frozen plasma, and then protamine where you have heparin. Um, so in just let's go to the final slide, please. Uh, so in conclusion, I think even without touching, or I told you this is a big, big topic. Um, what I would encourage us is always to have a high index of suspicion remember about the risk factors, always try to establish what is the risk factor in my patient, then look at what are the tests that you need to do, there are those that you do for confirmation, and then choose the ideal agent for anticoagulation based on what we have discussed. Uh, sorry, I didn't have time to go into the special considerations, uh, but I hope that with what I've shared, that uh, this would be able to help us. And then also when you get the slides, you can actually review the other subject matters in terms of what to do in the different or what we look call the special consideration. So thank you very much. 
And sorry, I have really gone over time. Um, and I hope that this has been useful. And thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity. Thank you.